thank you DataCamp for sponsoring today's video. More on them later. In 2020, I finished my PhD. Those years of my life were full of frustrations, hard work, joy, adventures, and most of all, a lot of learning experiences. You can see some of them in my earliest videos. But what was it all about? My PhD hat doesn't even entirely appear in the frame because of how big it is. Can you see it now? <laughs> That's enough. I don't think I need to use it for the entire video. That's great, fantastic. This is a PhD hat that my colleagues did for me. It's a thing here in Austria. When you finish your PhD, your colleagues make you a PhD hat like that one. Hello everyone, it's Maria and welcome to my channel. First, I just wanna thank all my patrons over on Patreon for supporting me. Now that I'm in a transition phase from working as a researcher in academia to a freelance science communicator slash scientist, I don't know yet either. Their support is what has allowed me to put more effort into these videos. So thank you so much. If you wanna support me in that way, you can check the link for my Patreon down in the description or my affiliate links to try some cool stuff. Or you just help by actually watching and sharing the video, which you are, well, half of it already doing, which is already fantastic and great. Do you know what else is fantastic and great? My PhD. <laughs> oh, sure it is. Okay, Maria, we know. So what is it all about? To answer that question, we have to go back in time. In the early 1900s, a Belgian chemist called Leo Hendrik Bakeland created Bakelite, the first entirely synthetic man-made plastic. This marked the beginning of the modern plastics industry. Because they were relatively easy to manufacture, were durable, and could be shaped into any imaginable form, plastics quickly became a success and revolutionized practically every industry at the time. And since then, plastic production has skyrocketed. On average, plastic annual production has increased 8.5% every year since 1950. Plastics have become an integral part of our lives. If you look around you right now, you will probably spot many items that are either made of or contain plastic. Like your phone, computer, office material, chairs, cameras, glasses, electronics, cosmetics, clothes. You get the idea. Plastic has been important in many fields, like medicine, science, technology, amongst others. But extreme consumerism, overuse of packaging and single-use plastics, accompanied by a lack of proper regulations and plastic waste management, have led to serious health and environmental problems. These are plastic samples collected in the North Pacific Gyre. When I was there, I collected samples and plastics of all sizes imaginable, from plastic bottles to plastics like this. Can okay, you barely see them? Called microplastics because, well, they're tiny. The North Pacific Gyre is one of the main accumulation zones in the ocean. But plastic has reached practically everywhere, including the Challenger Deep, which is the deepest point of the ocean in the Mariana Trench. And there are tons of millions of plastics entering the ocean every year. This worries us. We know the obvious effects that plastics have on marine life. The number of deaths per entanglement and uh, plastic ingestions has been increasing by the minute. But there are still a lot of unanswered questions that we now more than ever need answers for. And this is where my thesis comes in. Let's take a closer look. Oh, hello? I didn't see you there. Back in 2014, I was working as a laboratory assistant at the Microbial Oceanography Group at the University of Vienna, which is actually where I am right now filming this. In that same year, I decided I wanted to do a PhD, but I had to decide on a topic to write a grant about, which would be the topic that I would be researching during that PhD. That was also more or less the time that the plastic issue in the ocean started really being talked about. 
And as a marine biologist, I was very aware of this issue. And I was also very aware, because I was working in a group that works with microbiology in the ocean, that there's a lot of bacteria in the ocean that can eat a lot of stuff. They're just really versatile. And I knew that there were some, some bacteria that can degrade oil. And the reason why this is very interesting is because a large part of the plastic produced today is made from oil. Understanding if plastic is biodegraded in the ocean is one of, one of those important questions I was telling you about before. Biodegradation is the breakdown of materials by microorganisms into simpler substances. In the case of plastic biodegradation, the resulting substances can be water, carbon dioxide, methane and nitrogen. If we are to understand the impact of plastics in the ocean in its entirety, we need to know where they will end up, in which state and for how long. And knowing if they can be biodegraded or not is an important part of finding those things out. And unlike oil degradation, there was not much known about it. And so the wheels in my brain started turning and I decided to write a PhD proposal about the interaction between plastic and the ocean and bacteria. When I started writing this grant, there was not much known about this interaction between bacteria and plastic in the ocean. But one thing we did know was that after being in the ocean for a while, plastic started being covered by something called a biofilm. A biofilm is a group of organisms, microorganisms, that attach to each other or a surface via this kind of glue they produce. This is not uncommon. Most objects, once they're in the ocean, do have this biofilm developing around them. But we didn't know how the bacteria in these biofilms interacted with the plastic surfaces. So, for example, whether or not some of those bacteria could potentially degrade the plastic. And that's what I wanted to find out. The first question I wanted to answer was, do different plastic types have biofilms with the same bacterial community composition, or are they different depending on the plastic type? A little side note, from now on when I talk about community composition, I'm referring to the species in the community and their relative abundances. For example, these two forest communities would be considered to have different community compositions, because even though they have the same species, the relative abundance of each species is different in each community. This is also how we analyze the microbial communities in our study. I am not going to go into the specifics of any of these studies or the specific methodologies, otherwise I would literally bore you to death and I don't want that on my conscience. But I will talk to you about the most interesting findings in my studies. Let's start with the first question. You might be thinking, well, Maria, how does that matter? How does answering that particular question help answering the more important plastic in the ocean questions? The question, is plastic biodegraded? actually does not make a lot of sense. And the reason for that is, well, there isn't one type of plastic. There isn't just like one plastic. Plastic is a broad term that englobes every synthetic and semi-synthetic organic compound that can be shaped and molded into solid objects. There are many of those. For example, you can identify what type of plastic some items are made of by looking at the symbols. Different types of plastics have different chemical compositions. And it is possible, and actually probable, that different plastics will be biodegraded differently, or degraded in general differently, depending on what type of plastics they are. So for example, just because one bacteria might be able to degrade one plastic, doesn't mean it will be able to degrade another one. So we wanted to understand if there are certain bacteria that prefer prefer, they don't really, it's not an active choice, but that are more found in certain types of plastic than on others, because this could be an indication that these bacteria are degrading it, or at least are utilizing the plastic in some way. For this part of my research, I made my way to Hovin, a coastal town in Croatia, where together with a master's student that was working with me at the time, I developed an experiment. It involved hardcore engineering, and the result? The brilliant masterpiece you see here. Okay, it might not be the next wheel, but well, it worked for our purpose. We attached different types of plastic to the structure and left it in the ocean for three months. 
and throughout that time we took samples to monitor the bacterial communities growing on the different plastics. It was a lot of fun and very cold. We are really cold, so we were 27 minutes in the water. I can't even really talk, my, my face is freezing. Via experiments and the magic of DNA and bioinformatics, we found that some bacteria did indeed prefer certain types of plastics over others. Sometimes. What we found was that the bacterial communities that lived on these three plastics plus glass were relatively similar to each other, but they were different from the communities that grew on PVC. A possible explanation for this difference is the presence of additives. Additives are chemicals that are added during the manufacturing process to plastics to increase their function. For example, increase malleability, durability, amongst many other things. And to make things more complicated, as if they weren't complicated enough, different plastic types can have different additives, and they can have different additives in various concentrations. And PVCs are usually the type of plastics with higher concentrations of additives. For example, we know that in our particular study, the PVCs we used had really high concentrations of plasticizers, which is a type of additive, which the other samples did not have. So it is possible that some of the bacteria that grew a lot on PVCs did so because they could utilize these plasticizers that the other plastics didn't have. This would give them a competitive advantage in relationship to the other bacteria that cannot utilize the additives. There might also be some bacteria to whom the additives are harmful and therefore have a disadvantage in relationship to all the other bacteria to whom the additives are not harmful. Or probably we, add, we have a combination of all these relationships that end up with the communities that we observed in our study. It could also be that indeed some of the bacteria that preferred PVC or that were found in higher abundances in the PVCs can degrade the actual PVC plastic. Welcome to science. <laughs> One question answered, a million more arise. But there was something very, very interesting in our study that I still haven't talked about. And that is that we found some bacteria enriched in low density polyethylene that were closely related to oil degraders. Not many, they were not very abundant. They were actually relatively rare in comparison to other types of bacteria that were growing on the plastic. But there were still some, and those seem to have a preference towards LDP in comparison to all the other samples. Can these bacteria degrade low-density polyethylene? That was the second question I wanted to answer during my PhD. If you are interested in chapter two of what I did, in my PhD. Let me know down below and I will make a video to talk about whether or not there are bacteria that can degrade low density polyethylene. So let's recap. Did I answer my question, the question that I set out to answer? Are there differences between the communities developing on different plastic types? Well, yeah, sometimes. Why? Good question. <laughs> you might be thinking to yourself, if you found these differences between the communities growing on different plastic types, but you can't explain why they exist, if you can't say that these differences are a result of some bacteria being indeed able to degrade certain plastic types, isn't the study useless? Well, that's just how science works. You answer big questions by answering smaller questions one at a time, and by building on previous knowledge and previous answered small questions. For example, our study indicates which bacteria would be interesting to test for their ability to degrade specific plastic types. So, our study did not prove that there are bacteria that can degrade plastics or plasticizers, but it points towards a direction and answers small questions that will ultimately help answer bigger ones. There were a lot more things that I studied in this specific part of my PhD that I not, did not include in the video because otherwise this video would be a million hours long, which is a lot of hours, let's be honest. No one would watch that. But if you are interested in going through some boring technical stuff, you can check out my study. I will link it down below. It has all of the things I talked about and there's a bunch of more stuff there that I didn't talk about if you are interested. That paper man gave me a lot of headaches. I am not going to lie because there was a lot of bioinformatics 
mathematics and statistics involve. Something that a lot of people don't realize marine biologists have to deal with, especially those that work with a lot of DNA data, like me. There's a lot of data analysis and bioinformatics that uh, I had to learn while doing my PhD that I never learned before. I didn't even know there were tools that I could learn from. Tools like today's sponsor, Datacamp. Datacamp is an online platform that offers courses in all things data science. They offer courses to any level, from beginners to intermediate to advanced, in a wide variety of different topics. As a biologist and an ecologist, I work a lot with a program called R, which is a program you will probably have to deal with if you go into any field in ecology or biology, by the way. And I was checking some of their courses, especially this one on the package deplier, which I've been wanting to learn for a while and I already did learn like in a couple of I don't know 10 minutes 20 minutes they give you explanations for why things work the way they do and then give you exercises for you to put in practice what you just learned so if you're interested in just learning basic programming for you know building a website or if you want to delve more into data science, or even if you don't want to learn how to program, but you want to have some tools to deal with finances or just learn some basic Excel, DataCamp is for you. And you have all this knowledge at your fingertips. You can check out the link in my description and you can try the first chapter of any course for free. Go for it. Thank you very much, DataCamp, for sponsoring today's video. Overall, I enjoyed my PhD. I had really great experiences. I learned a lot. I met some really cool people, some of with whom I'm friends now. And I think it was a life-changing slash really important life learning experience for me. So this was the first part of my PhD. If you're interested in knowing a bit more about my PhD, let me know down below. And I can do make this a uh, two or three-part series. I also want to acknowledge all the other scientists that work in the same topic as I did during my PhD, because if you watch my video, it might make it, it feels maybe like I'm the only person who's researching this very important topic. I am not. There are many people researching this, many research groups all around the world that are doing a great job. But yeah, I just want to acknowledge all my fellow scientists out there. Thank you for your great work. I would not have done this PhD without it. This is like my Oscar speech. <laughs> Thank you to my mom and my dad and all the scientists that have <laughs> helped me along the way. All right. That's not funny. Thank you to all my patrons over on Patreon for supporting this channel and my other channel and all my adventure into science communication. Thank you all for watching. Share this video and subscribe if you want to watch more marine related content in this channel. Thank you very much for watching and I hope to see you in the next one. Bye.